This is going to be an item by item tour of the menu of the Canon SL1 and let's just get right into it. So I am in menu and um, I'm on the first page. I'm also shooting in manual mode. It's important to note that on the dial depending on what mode you are in you have um, greater or fewer choices. Here you can see now I'm in auto and I have very few menu items uh, across the top. But when you go up into your letter modes, your creative modes, um, you have more options available to you. In fact, the menu is full. So your first option on camera one screen is your image quality. And you can set this anywhere from shooting small JPEGs all the way up to RAW files or RAW file plus a large JPEG. RAW files, of course, uh, hold more information and more dynamic range but you need to work with a program on your computer to edit those. Beep, whether or not it beeps when it gets focus. The driver or self-timer mode, you have single shoot, continuous shooting, and then of course the self-timer with 10 seconds, a self-timer with two seconds, and then a self-timer continuous where after a certain number of seconds, it takes a number of shots in a row up to 10. Review shutter without, release shutter without card on. If this is on and you don't have an SD card in there, it will take pictures and it will briefly show you those, but it will not save them anywhere. The length of time that you want an image to remain on the screen after you've taken a picture, you can set this anywhere from off to save battery life, all the way up to it holds the picture on the screen until you press something like the shutter button to activate uh, your live view again, or just the camera ready to take a picture. Lens aberration correction. When you have different lenses on, you can automatically have the camera do some vignetting correction, which is your kind of darkened circle around the edges of frames, and chromatic aberration, which is your purple fringing along high contrast areas. If you want the maximum frames per second, you should turn those things off, but otherwise you should leave them on because it does make your pictures look a little bit nicer. Red eye reduction, it's going to be watching for people with red eye, and it's going to try to fix those automatically. Camera page two, we have our exposure composition, our flash, and also our bracketing, so you could set here with using the front dial by the shutter and it will now take three pictures each at those exposure points. That is great for doing your own HDRs. So let's just put it back and of course you can also just adjust to adjust the exposure above or below what the camera considers to be centered or middle exposure. You have uh, a lot of flash options here as far as whether or not you want it to be enabled in the metering mode. Uh, most of these settings you can leave as is. You have the built-in flash functions, whether or not it fires when the shutter first opens or when it first closes. That's what first and second curtain is. The exposure composition. I have a video up that talks about uh, setting your exposure composition. And if you have an external flash plugged into this camera, you can control it through the menu on the back. And that is often much nicer than working through the buttons on the back of most flashes. ISO auto. If you turn ISO auto on, it wants to know what is the maximum you will allow it to go to, or the highest maximum you will allow it. And so you can set that here. Uh, 3200, 6400, it really depends on what kind of shooting you're doing. Um, I often leave mine all the way up at 6400. Auto lighting optimizer. Um, and this is disabled during manual exposure. That's important to note. Uh, the camera does not try to do this, but when you're shooting in auto modes, the camera is watching and making adjustments to kind of keep your shadows from getting too dark and your highlights from getting too bright. Again, I shoot raw most of the time, so this has little effect or actually no effect um, and has no effect when you're shooting in manual exposure mode. Well, this is where you set your white balance, and this is kind of the color temperature for the shooting conditions you're in. Uh, I leave mine on auto white balance most of the time, but you have different options and including custom. So you could take a picture of a gray card or a white card and then use that to set your white balance in, your, um, in the camera. You can also custom white balance. This is the same as the last option that I was just on. Whereas if I had a gray card here, I would press set and it would use this to set the white balance. And if we go back to live view real quick, you can see that it's done a nice job. 
and you even have the ability to shift your white balance just a little bit. Color space, you want to leave that on sRGB unless you know exactly what you're doing. Picture style, I leave mine on auto most of the time and again it doesn't matter if you shoot raw but these can adjust the way the images, the JPEGs, look coming straight out of the camera. You have uh, control over sharpening, contrast, color saturation, all of those are options and you can create your own by pressing the info button and you can see you have your sharpness, contrast, saturation, and color tone and you can make adjustments to those. Those do apply to movies as well, it's important to note. AF operation, you have a choice here of one shot where it focuses and then lets you take the picture. AI focus, which is where it does try to make some guesses about your subject to keep it in focus as it's moving. And AI servo is where it is constantly in focus and will allow you to take a picture even if the camera doesn't think it's in focus um, as it is constantly focusing. I leave mine on one shot most of the time. I'm very rarely taking pictures of fast moving objects, but you may want to try AI focus or AI servo if you find yourself often taking pictures of fast moving objects. The different metering modes. This is the kind of eyeballs of the camera looking at your scene and determining what it should set uh, for the exposure. Evaluative meeting metering puts some weight on the center dot you see there, but then considers the whole scene. Partial metering is much more of a of the scene with no weight really being given to any one area. Spot metering is looking at just where you have put that center dot and figuring out what your exposure should be from that point. A great example of that is somebody in a spotlight they are going to um, want to be exposed much differently than the darkness around them on the stage and spot metering is great there. And center weighted average is really a very broad look at the whole scene. Dust delete data. This will allow you, and you should only do this once you start seeing dust spots come showing up regularly in your photos um, and after you've done the routine cleaning. Um, this will allow you to take a sample image um, of a blank white wall or a completely clear sky and at a very high aperture it will then use that to reference the dust spots and try to post process them out before actually giving you your image. Long exposure noise reduction. For exposures longer than one second, this will reduce, re remove additional noise. I have this turned off because I believe Lightroom does a better job, but if you don't use Lightroom and you want to take exposures longer than one second, especially star, starry night shots, then you may want to try this. Um, it does soften your image a little bit as part of the noise reduction. High ISO speed noise reduction. Uh, usually, um, I'm surprised this is set on standard right now, usually I have this off as well. And again, this does not apply to raw images, this only applies to JPEG images. And at higher ISO, it does some noise reduction as well. We're now on to the kind of video or live view options. So live view shooting is enabled. You have only a choice there of enabling it or di disabling it. In live view, you have several different autofocus methods. You have the face tracking, flexi zone where it's kind of looking at the whole area, flexi zone where it's looking at a single point that you set, and quick mode. Quick mode being where it flips the mirror back down, focuses quickly, and flips the mirror back up, turning live view on. That is not uh, usable during video, of course. It doesn't even let you, but it wouldn't be otherwise because it's Anytime the mirror is down, the video is not being filmed. You should use Flexi Zone AF the first or second whenever you're not filming somebody in the scene. If you are filming somebody, then their face is going to be present and you want that person to be focused uh, or in focus, then you should use the face tracking. It all works quite well. Continuous AF, this is where the camera is continuously refocusing the lens to keep the scene in focus. You can enable or disable this. For those of you who have watched my other videos, I do disable this for most of my videos because I'm just sitting in 
uh, one place sitting still in the video it, and I pre-focus on me, you don't need to have it continuously focus, focusing because maybe if I lean to the left or the right as I am working, it may um, you know, refocus on the wall behind me, which is distracting. Um, so I leave that disabled. Touch shutter. Um, that allows you to touch the screen to take a picture, and that is enabled right now as well. So if I turn live view on here and you can see my scene, if I touch, it will focus quickly, and then it will take a picture. Oh, I actually have it in self-timer right now, so it's counting down. Four, three, two, one, and then it's going to take a picture. Oh, it's going to take a bunch of pictures because if you remember, I left it on that continuous focus back then. Um, that was, let's turn that off real quick. So I'm going to come back over here to drive self timer, turn that on normal, and I'm going to go back to the right where I was. So that was touch shutter. You can have a grid displayed on the screen, the rule of thirds, which is great for composition. And now you can see that I do have a grid displayed on my screen. And you can also have a tighter grid displayed as well. That might be a little too much. I find the tic-tac-toe one to be plenty. You can shoot in different aspect ratios with the SL1. Um, and those are 3, 2, 4, 3, 16 by 9, and your Instagram favorite 1 by 1. It is important to note that these aspect ratios are only applied when you're shooting JPEG. Again, they're ignored when you shoot RAW, and they are only applied when you're shooting in live view. You do not see these aspect ratios through the viewfinder up here, only on the back of the screen. Let's do one to one real quick because you'll be able to see that quickly and now you can see the black borders on the side. And if you shoot with an iFi card, you could send those images straight to Instagram if you wanted to. Metering mode, when you're in live view, how often should it be figuring out the exposure for the camera? And four seconds, 16, 31, 10, or 30 minutes. Um, it really depends. The default is 16 seconds and you should probably leave it there most of the time. That is enough to adjust for changes in light, but not too much that the camera needs to be constantly flickering and changing the exposure. Uh, if you want it set in one place for a very long time, you want to extend that length out. Now we're in the playback menu option number one and starting at the top you can protect images in on the card. I very rarely if ever use that except when I'm shooting with an iFi card. If you want to know more about an iFi card just leave a comment down below. I do have other videos about iFi cards. They're very nice. They allow you to beam your pictures wirelessly from this camera to a computer, to a smartphone or tablet. You can rotate the images that are on there. You can erase images. A quick tip for you is not to spend time erasing images here. Shoot your images out in the field, come back, download all of them, delete the ones that are messy on your computer where you can quickly tell on your big computer screen whether or not they're in focus or whether it's an appropriate image to keep or not. And then put the card back in the camera and reformat it. Do not spend time erasing or erasing all of the images on the card. That leaves the cards much messier than reformatting. You can set up print orders and print directly from this camera. You can also set up a little photo book within it. And honestly, I've never used these features um, in here. Creative filters. You can apply creative filters to um, images that you've taken. Again, they have to be JPEGs. And you have your options of your grainy black and white and it will process that and turn it into a grainy black or white. You have your options of how much contrast you want. I very rarely use these because um, they, you have the option of doing all of this on the computer and getting much better results, especially if you use a program like Lightroom. But they're all in here. Fisheye effect, art bold effect, water painting effect, toy camera effect, and a miniature effect where it looks makes everything look like a little miniature scene. And you can resize images. 
within the camera. This is another thing I know I just started mentioning and keep mentioning now the iFi card, but this is a very nice way to make sure that the images you're sending off to the iFi card or to your device and then up online are of a normal size and not gigantic JPEGs. Uh, you can resize here by just choosing one of these things and choosing set and then you'd save it as a new file and then you would have two versions of that the normal size or whatever size you shot it at and then the smaller size as well. You, in addition to resizing, you have cropping. Now resizing takes the whole image and shrinks it down. Cropping, of course, allows you to lop off parts of the image. And you can see that across the top, you have multiple options here for the uh, setup. You can change the aspect ratio. There's our 1 to 1, our 4-3, our 16 by 9. That's our 3-2 normal and then our one-to-one -one again and we're going on through like so. You can also press the info button to switch the aspect ratio, so up and down or left or right, um, and you can move and you can use the zoom in to um, really get it to where you want. So it's, it's fairly neat that you have these tools within the camera. So I've just cropped this image down to a much closer look and now I have the original which I'm looking at now, plus the newly cropped image. Histogram display, when you're in live view, you can have a live histogram, which is basically just a graph of the brightness and dark values of the pixels that are in the scene. I have a video about reading your histogram, so that's all I'm going to say about that. Using the control pad on the back allows you to navigate through images, but you can also use the dial up on the front of the camera by the shutter to navigate through. And if you use that dial, you can set it to jump through 10 photos at a time, 100 photos, display by date, or I often use it to display movies only. If you shot a bunch of stills and a bunch of movies and they're all mixed together, it's a nice way to be able to quickly find your movies by using this dial to jump through them. And this dial will go through everything one by one. But you can set it however you want, including by folder or by rating as well. These cameras are capable of displaying a slideshow and it will take all of your images and just start to play them. You even have the option of adding in some music that it will find. If you've got any music on the card, any kind of MP3 files, it will take those and play. You can have a uh, cable hooked, an HDMI cable hooked up to your TV, and it is going to pipe your images and your music over that. So you have a nice little slideshow package built in here, and you can display time, repeat what kind of transition effects that you want, um, and of course the background music, as I said. You can rate images within the program. So we can go left or right, of course, to go through images, and then up or down to add ratings. So I just rated this three stars. If I was going to import this image into Lightroom, that rating would come through. And then control over HDMI uh, is disabled. If I plug this into a HDMI capable recorder that had play and pause functions built in, it would allow me to control the start and stop of this. Now we're kind of into the setup menu. That's what these little wrenches represent. Menu the setup number one. We can select the folder that we are saving into. And I've actually had this card in a different camera. So I have a 5D folder in here and I can create a new folder to save into. 99.9% .9 of the time I let the camera do the folder creation and I don't create anything extra. File numbering, I leave on continuous. This is the very first picture you would ever take with this camera. It would be 0001 and it's going to go all the way up to 9999 and when you take that last 9999th picture it's going to start over at 001 again. Um, it's unlikely that you're going to have that many pictures on one card. And if you did, it would start a new folder. But um, I, your other options there are auto reset. It automatically resets every time you put a new card in or manually resets. And you can have it just do that anytime. Whether or not it rotates the images taken in portrait. And as I said, formatting a card. And every once in a while, you can do a low level format. How long before the camera should power off? I currently have that set at four minutes. Um, I think that's 
fine. You have other options too. If you wanted to really save battery life, you could lower that. Um, or you could disable it if you're doing a time lapse and there was a really long period of time between taking pictures. When the camera is not actively taking pictures, it really does use very little battery life. So you don't have to worry about that too much. The brightness of the LCD, if you're having trouble seeing it outside in bright sunlight, you can brighten it a good bit. You can see that um, on the back of this camera that looks too bright, but um, probably down there it looks good, but in real life it's a little bit better. Whether or not the LCD can auto turn off after a while, your date and time, your language that the menu system is in, and the video system. Quick note about the video system, if you are shooting at video 1080p, um, you have different options for 60 frames per second, well sorry, 25 and 30, 24 and 30 frames per second, and in PAL you have 25 and 50 frames per second. Actually, I don't think that's completely true. Let me go back for a second and show you that. Menu. Now I'm in video mode. I have two other options here. And on this one, I have, yes, 30 frames and 24 frames at 1080, or 60 frames at 1280, and 30 frames there. Now if I go into menu and go back over and change to PAL, and now I come in here, you can see that I have 25 and 24 and 50 frames and 25 frames. Uh, if you're not going to be displaying it on the television, it doesn't really matter if you have it set in NTSC or PAL. If you're just going to be uploading to YouTube, all of that is taken care of. But if you are going to be plugging, in, plugging it into your television, you do want it set for your zone or your area. So let's go back to that real quick and change that back to NTSC. Now we have different screen color options. Pretty straightforward. You can use the red if you're doing some astrophotography. But let's leave that right there. The feature guide. Sometimes you'll see when I'm working through the menu that there's little helpful pop-up tips and uh, that is enabled. Touch control, the SL1, does allow you to adjust the sensitivity of the touch screen. I have found standard to be just fine. Back here on the back, you can switch the, um, these two buttons so that what they do is different. You can have the AF point um, selection and magnify, or AE lock and reduce, or you can have this to be the AE lock reduce and this be the magnify. I disable, it seems fine. Sensor cleaning is the automatic little kind of static charge that cleans the sensor. And GPS device settings. This camera is compatible with Canon's GPS device. Um, it, there is no GPS built in though. And then that options are available if you have that GPS on there. Certification logos is silly. Custom functions. I will go in in another video another time. These actually are all the same as the T4i. So if you wanted to know these custom functions, you could watch that video. Copyright, you can have it automatically write your copyright information into the file um, before the image even leaves your camera. And that is something that I do recommend. And it gives you a little keypad in here and then you can put in your information. You can clear all of the camera settings so that you go back to the default settings. This is good if the camera's doing something that you are trying to figure out why. It didn't used to act this way. Um, pictures are coming out funny. One of the first things to try is to clear the settings to get, take everything back to that default setting and see if it's still giving you issues or still acting funny and then there well, must be another problem. Your firmware settings here and it's got camera and lens firmware. And then the final menu on the system is the My Menu Settings. This is a kind of frequently used system. You can set this up, register to My Menu, and then now it's every item that we have gone through and the video ones that we haven't gone through yet. Um, and you can find the ones that you use often and select them and put them out there on the My Menu. I have a video that shows you how to do that on the T4i, and again, it is the exact same, so you can take a moment and watch that. Let's go over the video settings really quickly um, because these were not available before because I had the switch set to on, but now that I've switched it to video, I have these two additional menu items, one of them replacing the live view uh, item. So this is our AF methods, as I said, the quick 
uh, focus is no longer available. We have the tracking. I've already mentioned those. Movie servo. Um, this is enable or disable um, the automatic focus during the uh, uh, during focusing with the video function turned on. If you're using the 18 to 135 or the 18 to 55 STM lenses, those are absolutely silent and will not be picked up by the onboard mic. Will you allow it to take a or no? When you press the half, sorry, when you half press the shutter button, do you want it to refocus automatically or to disable that? It's up to you. And a grid display similar to the live view shooting and your metering timing. On the second screen, you have your options for setting your movie recording size, sound recording, and you can see there that the microphone is picking up, and you have your choice of auto, manual, where you set the levels, and you can see that as I am talking and lowering those levels, that the peaks are getting lower and lower, and you can turn on your wind filter and attenuator. And video snapshot mode. I have a video up that talks about the video snapshot mode in much more detail. That will allow you to take two, four, or eight second clips of video and it will automatically sandwich them together into one video. It's a pretty nifty function, um, but you gotta be prepared to use it. Uh, so, that was a in-depth look at the Canon SL1 menu system. If you have any questions about any of the things that I've covered, want to see them in any more detail first you should search my channel because there are many videos that cover these items in more detail and if you don't find what you're looking for just leave a comment or question down below and I'll be happy to answer it. Thanks so much for watching.